Hi, and welcome to Chapter 3. We'll be looking at the uh, organizational environment and cultures. Uh, this is the third component of uh, Part 1 of the book, uh, just to make sure we put everything in context. So again, Part 1 is about intro to management, and what we're looking at here, we obviously uh, had a very broad uh, focus on uh, the first chapter on management. The second chapter is about the history of management all of the people who were involved in laying the foundation, the groundwork of management. We talked about uh, the uh, efficiency timeline. We talked about the humanistic timeline. And here now we're, we're switching gear to the um, organizational environments and culture. So definitely very, very important part of the book. Uh, the last uh, chapter of part one will be ethics and social responsibility, uh, which will be chapter four. Um, Peter Drucker, very famous uh, guy, we talked about him in the previous chapter, once quoted uh, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's the quote. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So again, this is a really critical chapter just to make sure that everybody understands that we can talk about planning, we can talk about you know all of the four functions, plan, organize, lead, control, all that stuff. We There's a lot of things you can do without a sound culture, a corporate culture, you get nothing. And the best way to think about this as we uh, start this chapter is where you work or maybe places you have worked in the past and think about a job you've had and how you felt uh, about your boss as a leader. Think about someone you really looked up to, someone that you would have uh, just gone the extra mile for with this company. And, and if your peers feel the same way that's a strong leadership and strong culture when you want to go to work you like the people you work with and you want to be part of that team that's that's what culture is um, so let's get going with the learning outcomes uh, we'll look at um, discussing how a changing environment affects organization and that's that's something that's going to be critical because obviously uh, if the environment changes it affects the organization ergo the organization changes and that's where having a strong culture helps describe the four components of the general environment and the five components of the specific environment I believe there's a little review here uh, describe the process that company use to make sense of their changing environment uh, so again just you know there's a term we'll, we'll look today we'll, 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 we'll uh, be introduced to called environmental scanning uh, and it's just like it sounds, you're permanently scanning the external environment. And so we'll again look at the process they use to, to, to make sense of that. Uh, how culture are created, uh, organizational culture are created, and how they can help companies be uh, successful. Then we'll look at um, all of the events outside a company that can influence uh, or affect it. I'm sorry, this is a changing environment. So here we're looking at changing environment and we're going to look at a couple of things. The first thing we're going to look at is just external environment, all events outside a company that can influence or affect it. Wherever you are watching uh, this uh, presentation now, if you're indoors, let's say, um, if you're indoors, think about the walls around you uh, and, and everything within the walls as the internal environment of the organization and everything outside the walls as an external environment. In this case, the external environment is, is pretty complex. And so we're, we're gonna look at that changing environment as part of that external environment. Uh, th what are the basic characteristics, right? Environmental change uh, are, is one of the basic uh, characteristics that, that you have to kind of make sure that you're familiar with. Obviously, in the middle of a pandemic, that's major change. Um, and, but what other changes come with it? What other components of the characteristics of the external environment exist? And the complexity of the external environment is another one. We'll look at scarcity as well. Uh, you know, what, uh, what is available to you? What is not available to you? Uh, everybody during this pandemic has experienced uh, scarcity firsthand, uh, especially at the beginning of it. Um, the environmental change is the rate at which a company's general and specific environment changes. 
uh, you have a stable environment where the rate of change is slow and a dynamic environment where the rate of change is fast. So if you think about a slow environment, you know, typically we're looking at, um, you know, even commodities, right? I don't know, steel, iron, kind of pretty reliably stable environment in terms of supply and demand. Um, there's a shift in global business, you will learn. There are shifts uh, throughout the world in terms of supply of, uh, um, in this particular case, these kinds of elements, iron, and the same thing with the demand. But they don't happen overnight, right? The rate of change is slow. Typically, they don't happen overnight. Dynamic environment, uh, very fast rate of change. Uh, usually, technology uh, would fall into that category uh, that as you've spent all this money on research and development, and you're coming up with some new gizmo, a new phone or something, uh, by the time you bring it to market and you get enough market share, uh, something else comes along. The rate of change is fast. Uh, so now let's go to the punctuated equilibrium theory. What's happening here is basically, it's the idea of saying, look, uh, there's changes, there's periods of changes where, like I said, even in steel, for example, it's supposed to be stable but maybe there's a tariff and that tariff creates the lack of stability and all of a sudden the prices of steel go way up. It uh, affects demand. There are trade wars. Um, and so, you know, things can go from stable to complex pretty quickly. And so that's what that means right there. Uh, this is followed by short periods of dynamic fundamental change and then again a new equilibrium. All right, now let's look at more on environmental complexity. Uh, what we have here is the number and the intensity of external factors in the environment that affect organizations. So that's what that means. It's pretty broad. It could affect a lot of things. Uh, you have the simple environment that has a few factors. An example would be the dairy industry. Very, very few factors. It's pretty much the dairy industry and the players know where they are, who they are. There's been some changes, um, especially in Southern California, here in the Inland Empire, for those of you who have followed um, because of real estate uh, prices going up uh, and different costs associated. There are actually a lot of dairy businesses that have moved out of the area. Um, the complex environment has many factors. Uh, example here from your author is the less than truckload LTL distribution uh, uh, companies. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, I just have this little figure here that kind of explains you have four manufacturers on the left with their own LTL uh, and then what happens once things get aggregated through uh, major distribution warehousing center in the middle, then uh, it continues directly to uh, specific uh, 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 consumers, right? The, the Walmart would be their consumer, Kroger, etc. Uh, you know, the multiple LTL orders sent shorter, cheaper distance to central consolidation center, so that's the one in the middle, and the remaining distance to distribution centers discounted at full truckload price consolidated with other customers. It's pretty smart. Uh, you will learn more about that when uh, after you transfer and you take um, operations management, which is a required uh, course. Uh, by the way, when I say things like that, I'm assuming, of course, you're transferring to a school that is accredited, AACSB accredited, and that you're pursuing a standard business degree, a Bachelor's of Science, Bachelor's of Art in Business Administration. Those are the programs that will require that you take that. Um, some of the schools that are not AACSB accredited, you don't, you know, they have their own little uh, way of doing things. Uh, resource scarcity uncertainty. So. Uh, the resource scarcity is the abundance or shortage of critical organizational resource in a company's external environment. Uncertainty is the extent to which you can predict which external trend and trends will affect. So imagine being a manager. Imagine being a, I don't know, a purchasing manager for a large organization. You have to buy a lot of components. Maybe you're making cars, maybe. And so, yes, there are things that are going to be scarce. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later on, but recently uh, when you know there was a lot of brouhaha between uh, the United States and Mexico over tariffs right and um, again remember what a big role Mexico plays in trade with the United States we'll, we'll talk more about that when we uh, cover the chapter on global 
just so you know, uh, Mexico is the second largest purchaser of goods uh, from, from the United States, right? Um, and so having said that, um, there's a lot of back and forth between uh, the border, right? And uh, what, what ended up happening with all these tariffs is that uh, the president decided to slap a bunch of tariffs on goods that would come from Mexico to the United States. The problem is that would have uh, crippled the auto industry uh, because of uh, subcomponents, right? And you have a part that is maybe made in the U.S., sent to Mexico, and a part is added to that part, sent back to the U.S., modified again, sent back to Mexico. These components, some of the components can do this multiple times. So if you have to stop a tariff every time it comes back, uh, then the cost is prohibitive. Uh, again, I'm explaining, giving you an example of scarcity here. Uh, I'm sorry, complexity and scarcity. Uh, this is where you look at that, you know, uh, environmental characteristics over uncertainty. And basically the way that it works is this. Uh, when, you know, you, you look at uh, a, in the environment, and when the uh, characteristics of the environment are more predictable, right? When the environmental change and complexity are at low level and res resource scarcity is low, that is resources are plentiful, uncertainty is also low. So what that means is that managers feel confident that they can understand, predict, and react to the external forces that affect their business. So that's what's happening all the way on the left all the way on the right now we're looking at uncertainty being extremely high both for complexity scarcity and change right those are the different colors and in this case of course what happens here managers may not at all be confident that they can understand predict and handle the external forces affecting their businesses um, so this is pretty straightforward i think um, you know again very logical let's kind of highlight a little bit let's look more at the general and specific uh, environment uh, in terms of uh, how they are uh, how that environment plays out uh, with the interaction with the organization right and so what we have here are at the very center we have that or that organization and so the organization very much at the center is affected by all the things around it uh, later on, when we talk about planning, we'll talk about uh, the, you know, we'll do something called a, a SWOT analysis, where I'll talk about the external uncontrollable environment. I, I want you to consider the specific environment here and the general environment as one environment being closer to the organization, if you want a uh, micro environment, and the other one being further out, the macro environment, the general, both still part of the external let's call it uncontrollable environment. So of course the customers play a huge role, uh, suppliers, uh, regulators, advocacy groups, and competition. So these are gonna be the closest thing to the company in terms of, in this case, we're gonna call them the specific environment. And then of course the general environment, what are the social cultural trends, the economy, uh, political legal trends, and the technology. Uh, for the sake of this particular chapter, we're going to leave it just the way it is. But obviously, there's a couple things missing when we, you know, dig a little deeper in in strategy and, and planning. Uh, you know, where is the global environment, right? Uh, and um, anyway, so just kind of food for thought. Uh, let's see. Moving along, uh, what we're doing now, just uh, so you know, what we're doing now is we're going to kind of highlight each component. So let's start with the economy. A growing economy provides a favorable environment for business growth. Uh, what that means is consumers have more money to spend. Uh, obviously, right now, it's kind of interesting, right? Uh, during this pandemic, uh, people, uh, of course, uh, are unfortunate uh, loss of jobs, loss of life, uh, and that's affected things. Consumers have less money to, to spend, right? And so we know that's been having a domino effect on things. Um, the, it influences basic business decision, right? So managers scan the environment, the economic environment, uh, and what they do here is they look at indices. An index is a ratio, basically. It's a fancy word. We're looking at ratios. Uh, the plural for one index, two indices. That's what we're looking at. 
And you can look at several things, by the way, but the business confidence index is what's being featured here for the economy. Uh, con consumer confidence index is another one. But focusing on the business confidence indices, this shows managers' level of confidence about the future business growth. Uh, what I have here for you, this hyperlink that is available, uh, it, you know, what I'll do is I'll just kind of show you one at a time. Uh, this is coming from the OECD, which is a organization of developed countries. Uh, and they usually meet to talk about improving, uh, you know, economics around the world uh, and benefiting society. And what this is tracking is business confidence index uh, in the OECD nations. Uh, and so, you know, it's looking kind of promising, isn't it? Uh, it, it really just, this is all Corona based over here, that big drop, but things are kind of looking up a little bit, they seem to. So um, again, you know, uh, and we could, you know, track things a little bit differently here. This is giving us uh, the OECD, uh, but you know, let me just add uh, the United States just to see where we are here. And so now when I compare the US to the OECD overall, you know, the US is looking pretty good, right? Um, maybe we add another one. Let's see uh, with, you know, uh, uh, China, how China is looking in terms of confidence uh, compared to the United States, right? And so you see that China was worse off, but China and the US are, are, are looking pretty good. Uh, again, you can, you can, you know, have fun with this, uh, you know, see what's going on in the world. Uh, let's just pick Italy, uh, see what's happening there. Uh, and you, you know, you get to see uh, different levels uh, in terms of where the gains are, but everybody's looking at the curves going back up, the shape of confidence is going back up. Um, all right. Hopefully um, this, this is, uh, you know, I use these things to illustrate what's in the book. Um, and I hope, you know, the, the purpose is to learn, right? The purpose is not just to memorize definitions for the exam. Uh, you don't need the whole lecture for that. Uh, the purpose is for you to extrapolate what's happening uh, and we're going way beyond definition and we're uh, going into how things work and application. So let's look into the second component, technology. The knowledge, the tools, the techniques used to transform input into output. Uh, technological change help companies provide better products, uh, making product more efficiently. Look at those robots. This is a Tesla factory, right? Uh, Tesla has more robots per car uh, being uh, uh, produced per capita and more robots than any other automaker in the world. Uh, and it was deliberate. Elon Musk wanted to be extremely efficient. The more cars he makes, uh, the more efficient he becomes. How? Uh, this is where scalability comes in, economies of scales. I'm sure you remember that from your econ class. So uh, that's, that's efficiency and provided here by robots. Uh, it must be used effectively to improve products and decrease cost. So this is the second one that I have here for you. This is showing in terms of technology what's happening here. Uh, smart companies are relying more and more and we're getting better at artificial intelligence uh, improving uh, customer service, right? Uh, and so that's kind of a new frontier in terms of uh, companies improving their customer service using AI. I'm just going a little bit beyond the book to show you what's happening currently uh, uh, in terms of using technology to improve and decrease cost. Then we're getting into the social cultural component, demographics, general behavior, attitudes and beliefs uh, of people in society. Uh, changes in demographic characteristics affect how companies staff their business. Uh, sociocultural changes in behavior, attitudes, and belief affect the demand for a business's product and service. So again, we've talked a lot about that. Uh, millennials, I know most of you are millennials, and because you guys care uh, more than any other age cohort, right? Millennial is a type of age cohort. Uh, Gen X, Gen Y, baby boomers, we all call these age cohort classifications. Uh, you care more about where your product comes from in terms of is the company ethical, socially responsible. And so that sociocultural component is driving companies to be better. Kudos to you. Political legal component. Well, we just covered the chapter on that, didn't we? Uh, so legislations, regulations, I don't think I need to go into too much detail about that. I know we spent time doing that in the uh, you know uh, 
I'm sorry, not the previous chapter, but we touched on it a little bit. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, as we go forward in the class. Uh, managers must be aware of the laws, the regulations, the potential lawsuits that could affect their business. And so obviously that's a critical component. Uh, pretty straightforward there, right? And then customer component is going to be a big one. Uh, customers purchase product and services. Companies cannot exist without customer support. And so the basic strategies for monitoring uh, uh, customers, what are the strategies? You can be reactive, you know, you wait until things go bad, basically, uh, and then, ooh, you know, let's change this instead. Or you can be proactive. Um, the auto industry is fascinating, right? You have, um, well, Elon Musk again with Tesla, uh, who is really able to kind of just change things with the people call him a disruptor. Because uh, initially, prior to Tesla, people thought, you know, these electric cars, I was you know, dorky, expensive, glorified, you know, golf carts. And he decided, I don't want people to buy a Tesla because it's electric. I want to buy a Tesla because it's the best car in the world. You know, of course, then that. So he just went out of his way to make sure that he delivered with that. And there are a lot of people who bought a Tesla, not because it was electric, but because they thought, in their opinion, it was an awesome car. That's very, very proactive. The rest of the auto industry has been, unfortunately, many companies have been extremely reactive, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the last uh, recession, you guys, maybe some of you are too young to remember that, but the last recession we had, uh, we had this whole cash for clunker business where, you know, people were buying these guzzlers and the government basically bought it off them because nobody wanted to buy them at, you know, gas costing $150 a barrel. And uh, in this case, these companies were just reactive. They were asleep at the wheel, if you will, uh, and uh, just selling big trucks because that was uh, where the money was and not really paying attention. Um, and so it's fascinating to see what companies are reactive, what companies are proactive. I will be talking uh, in this class when we talk about culture a lot about Tony Shea. So that's him on the right. He wrote a book called Delivering Happiness. Um, he is the CEO. Actually, he was the CEO of Zappos. Uh, which a company that sells uh, shoes online. Uh, famously, Zappos was uh, bought um, by um, Amazon because it was such a threat. Nordstrom is another company that's extremely uh, proactive. So again, key components, uh, smart businesses scan their environment and they're very in tune with their customers and they will try to stay proactive and deliver and give customers what they want ahead of time. Uh, the component of the specific environment. So now we're, we're, we're switching, we know we're, we're looking at the specific, um, we looked at customers, now we're looking at competitors. Uh, companies in the same industry uh, that sell similar products or services uh, to customers. I want you to think about that and think about the cell phone industry, the smartphone industry, and consider that once upon a time you only had very similar companies. You had Motorola, you had Nokia. Those were the companies that between them sold what you know, phones, cell phones. They weren't even really smartphones. Uh, and so in this case, they were all these companies in the same industry that sold similar product or services to customer. I want you to consider that uh, Apple was not in the business of phones at all. And Apple just was a you know a computer company. In fact, the official name of Apple was Apple Computer Inc. Uh, when Steve Jobs, which is the video that I have on the slide here, when Steve Jobs made his announcement that uh, he was uh, you know introducing a phone, a new smartphone that was revolutionized everything, uh, it, it was uh, a company that was not in the same industry and that did not sell the same product. So when you're doing your competitive ana analysis, you monitor the competition. There was absolutely no way that these companies had any idea that uh, this new entrant, that's what we call a new competitor like that, a new entrant, would come in and disrupt uh, the industry uh, completely with a new product. And, you know, of course, uh, initially their market shares absolutely dropped and uh, Apple cornered the market. Uh, today, remember that Apple is a, a you know, $2 trillion company. It's one of the biggest on the planet. 
So uh, I have a clip here for you to watch. I, I recommend you watch it. It's, I mean, it's a historic clip. This is uh, Steve Jobs announcing uh, the introduction of uh, the smartphone, and of course, uh, it's on the slides. Um, so moving along with, you know, it, oh, I'm sorry, involves identifying competition, anticipating their moves, and determining their strengths and weaknesses. And this is all great, um, but it's not always possible, case in point, the example that I gave you. Now here's the good news. The good news is no one really has a monopoly on uh, research and development. No one has a monopoly on innovation. Uh, and the strategy of Apple, by the way, is it is a premium product. Apple sells an expensive product. Not everybody wants to spend a thousand dollar or or slightly less for a phone. And so fast forward, and what do we have? Well, look at 2009. Uh, you know, and and look at in this case, uh, iOS. Kind of from 09 to 2015, what's been going on? When you look at worldwide smartphone operating system market share based on sales, uh, you know, in this case, Android is the champion. Now, obviously, Android is cheaper and uh, Android um, it, it is, is uh, favorable throughout the world because of its price point. Uh, but Apple, uh, because it is a premium product, has more revenue, ergo, uh, you know, more profits. And so just, just kind of a way for me to show you that even the mighty Apple uh, maybe is not interested in all market share throughout the world and focusing on profit, but they are spending a lot of time and effort uh, increasing their market share. Uh, and so now let's look at the change of speed and let's look at suppliers, right? Uh, companies that provide the materials, human financial, informational resource to other companies. Um, and so, you know, you're thinking about, again, the aluminum uh, that uh, Tesla buys uh, from these companies. You, you've seen them on the freeway, I'm sure. Uh, these semi trucks with these huge flatbeds with the huge aluminum rolls on there. Um, and so there's this idea of supplier dependence. Uh, supplier dependence uh, in this particular case is kind of like the example that I used earlier uh, about uh, the, uh, the parts coming in from Mexico, right? Uh, Trump steps into a Mexican labyrinth. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, came out in May 31st um, of last year when uh, he decided to try that tariff with Mexico. The cost of unwinding complex, multi-layered supply chain is a murky question. Uh, and of course, the consumers would pay the heaviest price. And so this is just an example of be, you know, the dependence on suppliers, the degree to which a company relies on a supplier because of the importance of their product to the company and the difficulty of finding other resources for that product. Uh, we also saw, saw that firsthand at the, at, you know, the onset again of uh, you know, the uh, pandemic. And then we're getting into uh, industry regulations, uh, regulations and rules that govern the practice and procedures of specific industries, business and uh, professions. Uh, you have advocacy groups, concerned citizens who band together to try to influence the business practice of specific industries, business, and professions. Uh, what I have next for you is something that actually has affected uh, Chafee College. Uh, you know, when uh, some states uh, decided to have policies uh, that uh, differed from other states about how they were going to handle uh, undocumented citizens, and, and more importantly, uh, how they would um, proceed in terms of, uh, you know, uh, pulling somebody over and what kind of questions uh, they were asking. Uh, well, Arizona, uh, you know, at the time, I haven't followed up lately to see if they still do it, but uh, Arizona proactively decided uh, uh, to um, uh, anybody who was undocumented to arrest them and uh, put send them uh, for transfer. Uh, and so what California did, and a bunch of other states actually, California boycotted uh, California, uh, sorry, uh, Arizona. And um, what we, we ended up at Chafee College getting uh, distribution from the Chancellor's office. Uh, and I know this was true of community college system, the Cal State system, and the UC system. So we're talking about billions and billions of dollars here uh, for conferences. And the, uh, uh, all of the chancellors of all three systems said uh, they would not approve or pay for any conferences in those states. And that was the way uh, for those districts for them 
to boycott these states. Um, so I'm just giving you an example. Uh, you know, it could be public communication, media, advo media advocacy, uh, uh, you know, boycotts, you name it. So how do you make sense of the changing environment? I know earlier I talked about environmental scanning, right? Involves searching the environment for important events or issues that might affect an organization. Um, I have a picture of this gentleman here uh, reading the Financial Times uh, from uh, Getty, giving credit where credit is due. Uh, and what's uh, what the reason I have this picture is I want you to just kind of visualize leaders always scanning. The, um, one of the things that uh, executives have in common with each other, regardless of the company or the country, is that they are news junkies. All of them are news junkies. They're always, always scouring, scanning the environment, trying to see, uh, you know, what uh, the external environment is up to. And again, it could be uh, what, you know, legal, political, social, global, technological, environmental, competitive, everything we've just talked about. Um, and so, again, how do you make sense of that? You try to interpret the external environment and, uh, you know, uh, viewed by managers as either threats or opportunities. Uh, there's some new change. How can I take, you know, first is how can I take advantage of that? And if I can't, well, how do I need to react so that I make sure it doesn't affect me negatively? And so you decide how to act on threats and opportunities. One of the ways you can do that is with what we call uh, cognitive maps, where you summarize perceived relationships. This is just an example of a, of a cognitive map here. And so, again, this is just a... a a, a, a nice visual way for executives to make decisions. Um, let's see, the internal environment, uh, here we go. So internal environment, uh, events and trends inside an organization that affect management, employees and culture. And, um, you know, I have this uh, clip here from ABC of um, Tony Shea, again, uh, up until recently he was a CEO of Zappos, he just stepped down, he just retired. Uh, I encourage you to read it, 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 it to, to watch it. It's very short, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea as to his values, um, Tony Shea's values. Here's a guy who's a multimillionaire and has decided that, um, you know, in terms of uh, his housing requirement, uh, he lives in a trailer right outside, uh, you know, you, you see them in the back there. He lives in one of those trailers and he, and he walks to his company every day. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it kind of sets a tone for, for what's important. Uh, the creation and maintenance of culture, the source of organiza organizational culture. Again, another clip that I have here that I encourage you to check out. It's really interesting uh, because this guy's a legend. Uh, Herb Keller was his name, and he was the founder. Well, he is not the founder of Southwest Airline, but he's the one who really, uh, very early on when he took over, uh, put it on the map and made it what it is today, um, you know, creates uh, organizations in their own image and imprint uh, them with their belief. Um, I, I encourage you to watch the rest. Uh, again, it's him talking about culture and you will be amazed as to uh, what makes him different from other CEOs and why people at Southwest just don't quit. Um, it's, uh, it's a very, very, uh, uh, one of those companies has a tremendous amount of loyalty. Um, let's see. Moving along uh, with uh, organizational culture, uh, the stories, uh, the stories that help make sense of the events emphasize culturally consistent assumption, decision, and action. Um, organizational culture is sustained by recognizing, celebrating organizational heroes, and holding organizational ceremonies. Uh, Bill Gates, right there, that's him uh, as a kid. Uh, he has such an amazing story. One day you really should, if you don't know his story, kind of see how he created uh, Microsoft uh, with, with uh, Paul Allen and uh, Steve Ballmer. Uh, but that's him as a kid, uh, just really gifted, smart boy who helped even uh, his school uh, with uh, complex problem solving uh, with the, the computer that they had at the time. Uh, that had to do with scheduling classes and seating charts and things like that. Um, and so, you know, even as a young age, uh, I know that uh, m friends of mine, former colleagues in the computer industry who are, with, you know, still work at Microsoft, um, everybody really admired the man 
because he had that his story was such an amazing story of how he created the the company uh, that it's it's used uh, still today in in various meetings uh, the key to culture that you know fosters success being adaptable uh, involving employees having a clear mission and being consistent these are the four keys to culture uh, the behavioral addition and behavioral substitution so let's talk about now the hard hard task one of the hardest things things to do for a new executive, a new CEO who takes over a company is to try to change the culture. It's extremely difficult. Um, when you have a company that's been established, set it in its way, and unfortunately not really changing with the time, not adapting, uh, it's, 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 it's very difficult to get to convince employees uh, to change their the way they think about things. Uh, so that they can uh, adjust accordingly. Uh, so there's the behavior addition is one way of changing the culture where managers and employees perform new behaviors that are central to and symbolic of the desired organizational culture. It could be something simple, you know. I know in healthcare, uh, the the you know the way that the the paradigm was uh, with hospitals is we're here to you know help heal you. So you know we're not here to be your friend. We're you know you come in you're you're, you're sick or you broke a bone or something and I'm not here for you know customer service uh, well of course that was wrong and a lot of uh, you know big organization uh, in healthcare have realized that um, uh, you know in this particular case it was not only important but central to their mission and so trying to train employees uh, to be more consumer centric uh, took changing uh, the culture that was predominant at the time uh, and the behavior so that would be in addition like basically greeting people saying hello uh, something that you didn't use to do before would be an addition the substitution is changing the old behavior for the new behavior right and so uh, you know now uh, not you know in fact another another uh, cultural change that happened in healthcare is that again before you know, these a lot of the healthcare uh, organizations would see uh, customers, or in this case, patients, as needing to be, you know, healed, right? So you hurt yourself, you come in, I write your prescription, and you go, and we're done. What they realized was that was a, the, actually not central to their operation, but their operation doesn't need to be in the short term healthcare of me fixing you now, but in the long term healthcare. And what hospitals, uh, good hospitals, uh, the ones that are you know uh, at the top of the ranking on the Leapfrog Review, which is a, a think tank in the East Coast that ranks hospitals, they're the ones who are now seeing that the consumer is a customer as a whole, and that the behavior substitution was moving away from uh, me just worrying about trying to solve the problem for you now, but the behavior substitution is you as a human being. Uh, are you exercising? Which is why when you go to your doctor, they're asking questions that uh, not that long ago they were not asking. You know, how much do you drink per week? Uh, do you exercise more than 30 minutes? All these questions help them gauge whether or not they, they need to send you to some training seminar or give you some kind of a product, keep an eye on you, uh, so that you, you come back less often, actually, and they can focus on treating patients uh, uh, that really have uh, serious needs and without you falling into one. Uh, the changing of the culture again, managers should focus on the part of the organizational culture they can control. Uh, and so these are the things that can be observed. Surface level items such as uh, workers' behavior, symbolic artifacts expressed through values and beliefs. Um, you know, it, this can really be a lot of different things. Um, again, you know, do you smile when you greet some someone? I, I know McDonald's have had several students who worked there and uh, when you look at the training manuals it actually is part of the ranking uh, are you greeting someone are you smiling right what are the things that can be observed in the culture are people um, you know do they during the lunch break how did they behave how are they are they encouraged the manager is the manager approachable they have a corner office uh, with an administrative assistant there uh, that guards it or are they just part of the team and everybody's got the same kind of cubicle Anyway, very big deal. Uh, culture is central 
Um, so that it concludes this lecture. Um, I hope you got a lot out of it. I'm trying to keep them less than an hour, so that's 40 minutes now. Uh, and uh, you know, make sure that you uh, study your definitions before you take the quiz. And now that you've uh, you know seen the lecture, you are ready also for the assignment. We'll start on ethics and social responsibility next week.